So, HTTP in C++, how hard could it be? Turns out not very hard with CPP HTTP lib. So this is a C++11 single file header only cross-platform HTTP slash HTTPS library. We've done heaps of networking related stuff on this channel with C++, but we haven't actually looked at HTTP. For those of you who don't know what that is and how that's different to the networking we've been doing, this might not be the video for you. I don't know, should I explain all the different networking things? Nah, probably not. Anyway, what you're looking at here is HTTP. The way that we requested this website from some kind of server somewhere on the internet, it got delivered here, we can render it and display it. That happens using something called HTTP. It's just a protocol that we use to transfer data over a network. It's different than what we've been doing so far, which is a little bit more raw with TCP and UDP. This is a lot higher level in that it lets us create an actual server and then serve some kind of content. And then on the client side, we would create a client with some sort of HTTP address like this, and then use different methods such as get or post to actually request data. Which means that if you're not making some sort of multiplayer game or you're not streaming data constantly, you just wanna be able to, I don't know, have a database on a server and then read that from C++ for whatever reason, you would most likely use something like HTTP. You would request something from the server, the server would do all the processing and then it would serve you something. Now this library over here, CPP HTTP lib is the simplest thing I've used in my experience. I mean, it's a C++11 compatible, single file, header only, cross-platform library. Literally all you have to do is grab this httplib.h file and just include it. Include it in a CPP file and you're ready to go. So today we're going to take a look at how to use this and we're going to look at the full picture, including how to actually serve some data from our server so that we can then request and use it in C++. And to make things a little bit easier and to have an actual UI instead of just a command line tool, we're going to be using Walnut. I'll have a link in the description below to both Walnut and HTTP lib. Okay, so over here in Walnut, we have a really, really simple example. Most of this is actually just the example code that comes from the dev branch of Walnut in the example app. I have literally set up like the most simple HTTP example I could think of. First and foremost, we have to include this HTTP lib file. So here it is. This is, this is the file. All I did was just grab like this raw file and just save it. And then I'm just including it. That's it. That's how easy it is to use this library. And then what I'm doing is in the constructor of this example layer, I'm actually creating a client with an IP address. This is the IP address of a hosting a server that I set up for this. We'll have a look at that in a minute. And then what I'm doing is requesting this API page. That gives me some kind of result. This is the status of the result. So usually you'd expect it to be 200. These are just HTTP status codes. I'm just printing that so that we have some kind of idea as to what's going on. And then the body of the result is going to be a string which I'm storing inside this data string and then later rendering. Again, really, really simple example. We're going through the constructor first, we're grabbing the data and then we're reading from it. So there's really no need for threads or asynchronous programming in this case. Doing this on the main thread like this will probably increase your startup time slightly, but it's okay. We'll have a look at a more complicated example later in this video. So if we give this a run, once it opens, we have our data window with secret information. So this is the string that we're actually retrieving from the server. So what exactly is a server doing? Let's have a look at that. A server provided, of course, by Hostinger, the sponsor of this video. So Hostinger is by far my favorite web host on the internet because they have really, really high quality servers at really affordable prices. And they actually have a Black Friday sale on at the moment, which reduces their prices even more. So if you go to hostinger.com slash churno, you can have a look at all of their servers. The great thing about hosting is that they use AMD Epic processors and NVMe SSDs. You can see that every plan comes with all of these things, and that's really, really important for performance. They also use KVM servers, which just means that your server is running independently. Of course, you get full root access to do whatever you need on your server, and that together with their excellent DDoS protection and firewall just means that you're getting an excellent deal. So if we pick this KVM2 plan here, for example, over here at checkout, make sure that you use coupon code CHERNO to get an even bigger discount. Once you have got a server, it's time to set it up. Now, the setup process is super quick and simple. All you have to do is select a location for your server, they show you all the latencies here, which makes it really easy to select something close to you, or you can pick something closer to your users. There's a huge range of operating systems to choose from. I usually go with Ubuntu. And finally, just set a root password and you're done. Hosting will now set up your server and this usually takes only a couple minutes. And that's it, you're done. You can now SSH into your server and do whatever you like. As I mentioned, Hosting, I have an amazing Black Friday sale that is on at the moment. So go to hosting.com slash channel, link will be 
the description below. And don't forget to use coupon code CHERNO at checkout for an additional discount. Huge thank you to Hosting Art for sponsoring this video. Okay, so once we SSH into our server, I'm actually using the remote SSH plugin over here in Visual Studio Code. I've talked about this before, but this is by far my favorite way to like work with servers because it just opens up an environment right here in VS Code with a terminal, with an explorer, with everything. On that hosting a server, I just needed to make sure that I installed Nginx. That's my preferred web server that I like to use. So I just did that and that's it. I'm now running Nginx, which by default on a fresh install just sets up var www HTML as the directory for your website. At least that's the default website that it sets up for you. At the root of our server, if we just go to etc and then nginx, we have sites available and sites enabled. So if we look at sites available default, that's the default configuration that nginx comes from. And then you can see that the root here is var www HTML. So that directory is the root of this particular site that we are serving. These are all of the possible index pages, etc. Anyway, this isn't a tutorial on how to set up like a website using nginx, but for those of you who might not know much about this, hopefully this gives you some insight as to how it works. So if we switch on over into that HTML directory, then we have, of course, the default index page. If we navigate to our server's IP address just in a web browser like this, then this is what we'll see. We'll see this page being rendered here. Now from here, I just made a new file. I called it API just with no extension and I put some text in it, secret information. That is all you need. So now you should be able to see how we just go to this IP address and then slash API and that's the file. We're basically just just requesting that file by using get and the HTTP server, in this case, Nginx is serving us that file. Now we can change that. Let's just change this to say like new information from Cherno. We'll save that file and then we'll just run our program again and then check it out. We have new information from Cherno. So yes, as I mentioned, really, really simple example. However, if you are just getting started with this kind of stuff and you don't know how it works and you just don't need all that extra complexity, this is the simple case. This is just what we're doing. And with HTTP lib, you can see it's really easy to just grab some data from a server. Now, from here, the possibilities are endless. You could have like some PHP code, hopefully not. You could have some code running here, like server side even, you could be using JavaScript. It might be requesting some information from an actual database, building up like a whole like JSON kind of response for you with all the information you need. You can really do anything you want with this. Now you've made that connection between server and client. Now, let's take a look at a slightly more complicated example. We're gonna have a look at the web. So I did a little bit of Googling and I found this free weather API, openmeteo.com. You can see it's got an example over here as to how we can request some data from the API. And then the response is just in JSON. Now I have adapted this to show the weather of Melbourne. That's where I live. I just typed in Melbourne lat long. Here it is. I put that over here into the HTTP get request and that's it. It just gives us the current temperature over here, 19.7 degrees Celsius. Getting this into our C++ application is no different than what we just did, with the exception of probably wanting to parse this JSON. For the JSON parsing, I'm using this library over here. I'll have it linked in the description below as well. But then weather is also something that we probably wanna keep updating. So if the app is running, I don't really wanna just fetch the weather, the temperature once at the beginning and then just that's it. I wanna keep requesting it because I want that information to be up to date. So that's also something that this slightly more complicated example shows as well. So if we just hit F5 and take a look, then you can see that we have Ta-da, the weather over here, it's 19.7 degrees, awesome. However, the difference is that every minute this will actually update. So how does that work? If we have a look at how it's actually using that HTTP lib, it's basically the same thing. We just have our client that we set up with this website over here and then we request something using get. As you can see, it's just this URL, of course. Once again, we're printing the status, but then we're using that JSON library to actually parse it. And then we're grabbing the current temperature because that is what we need to do to get this double here. So this is actually a double. All the extra complexity, all the extra code around this is just to make this operation asynchronous. The thing is we're running our UI rendering every frame and we don't want any kind of network activity to interfere with that because requesting something like this from a server takes time. You can also see that this literally has to wait. It's a blocking operation to wait until we actually get that data back. It's not like we're setting up a callback and it will notify us later when it's available. No, like we just call get and that's it. Here's the result 
default over here. So it has to happen synchronously, which is fine as long as we have a separate thread that we set up over here. So that we're creating a new thread. It's this request thread over here that runs this function. And then it will just execute this code over and over again, he says, as he forgot the while loop. So this is what I meant to write. That's funny. Now, realistically, you want this to terminate if the application like is requested to be closed and all of that. But this is just a simple example. Let's just ignore that. So we have this loop that will run this code over and over again. However, you can see that it will sleep for one minute. So we'll run it like every minute, but again, on a separate thread. So this is kind of running concurrently, just sleeping mostly while we are continually updating our UI every frame. But then how do we get the data? How do we get the actual temperature from this thread to this thread? So many ways, so many different ways to do that. This is probably my favorite way in this case for this scenario to do that. The simplest way would probably be to just create like a mutex around the string that is like the weather info in this case. That's what we're displaying in the UI. That's what the temperature is. You could lock the mutex, set the temperature from this thread, then unlock the mutex. And then on the UI thread, lock the mutex, render, unlock the mutex, or at least lock the mutex, copy the data to a local string, unlock the mutex, and then later render with that local string. However, that requires locking a mutex every single frame, even though like we barely update this data, like once per minute, you know how many frames we render in a minute. If this is running at VSync on my monitor, which is 144 Hertz, that's a lot of frames. That's a lot of needless locking, unlocking mutexes. It just, it doesn't feel very good. So instead we double buffer this. We have two different strings and then an index into which one of the two strings we're basically working with. This index is also atomic to make sure that we're not reading and writing to it at the same time. So then all we have to do is in the common case, when we're just trying to render it, we just grab like whatever the current index is. And we use that to actually access this weather info array. But then when it's time to update the data, we grab that current index and we increment it. We write into the other index. So we could be reading at the same time, but we're reading from a different index because we haven't atomically written it yet. We're writing to one index, for example, index number one, we're reading from index number zero. And then finally, when that write has completed, we're going to store the new index, which means that next time we load this, it'll be our new index and we are reading and rendering the new updated data. Anyway, this is just a brief look into this kind of stuff. I didn't really plan this to be like a multi-threading tutorial or, you know, too much kind of multi-threading related. It's mostly about the HTTP, of course, but this is just the kind of stuff you need to do when you are dealing with networking. You need to make sure that a lot of your stuff is running asynchronously if it is repeatedly requested like this. I mean, honestly, even in the other example, I would also make that asynchronous. It's just, I was trying to be really simple and not involve threads at all. If you guys are interested in seeing more networking or multi-threaded related content, let me know in the comment section below. Currently in the first example we looked at in this video, we were just using Nginx as our HTTP server. However, HTTP lib can also create servers. So that would be something that I would love to explore in a future video. And also SSL, we have not touched anything to do with HTTPS because that involves roping in more libraries. Again, trying to keep things simple, but that is probably something that I would take a more serious look at in a more serious context. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to hit the like button. Definitely check out hosting.com slash churno. They have some amazing Black Friday deals on at the moment. It's honestly the best time of year to pick up a server. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.